My name is Julian Burntide. Okay, and uh, have you ever seen a UFO, Julian? I don't believe so. No? Have you ever been abducted by aliens? No. No. Have you ever met people who have seen UFOs? Uh, no, but I've met people who might think they've been <laughs> uh, who've seen UFOs uh, because I get a fair portion of people contacting me who I think are arguably crazy. Okay. And do you think we're alone in the universe? It depends on what that means. Um, if that means, uh, do there exist right now in the universe creatures who we would accept as sentient beings, then my instinct is to say probably not. But if the question means, are we the only sentient life form that ever has existed or ever will exist in the universe? I think the answer is very probably um, no, we are not the only one. Okay, you used the word sentience twice in your reply. Hmm. So our, fr let's see, our chimpanzee well, well, look, sentience? Um, oh, yeah, 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 of course. Okay, our frogs. Of course. Frogs, uh, um, yes, I think so. I'm, 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 I'm just sort of excluding... Um, the algae and seaweed. And well, I'm trying to figure out where you draw this line between where you're excluding, because we talk about <coughs> it's important to know where your in-group is, and so you're including yeah. vertebrates. <coughs> um, I think uh, yeah, I'm certainly including vertebrates. Yeah. Okay. How about how about worms? Um, I don't know. I've never been a worm, so I don't know if I have if well, a worm has self-consciousness. But I'm asking you about whether you think a worm has self con Well, we don't know. I you have no think, idea. You've never been a... I've never been a worm. You've never been a dog either, and you think it has consciousness. That sentence. is true. Because we see the way they behave, and we imprint on their behavior notions that come from our own behavior. Well, when wormologists spend hours and hours and hours looking at their favorite worms, they too mm. get a sense of their behavior. This actually comes into focus with frogs, which you asked about. One of the ancient Greeks, I think it was Apollonius, said, little boys throw stones at frogs in sport, but the frogs die in earnest. <laughs> and that suggests a certain sentience that we can all identify with. It does. And now what I'm trying to do is figure out where our sense of sentience disappears as we go to creatures that are less and less closely yeah. related to us. I think sentience really is uh, imposed by us on other creatures by, um, by our capacity to imagine ourselves in their position. I mean, most people can imagine themselves being a dog because everyone's grown up with dogs or cats, and they see dog behavior and cat behavior, which in some vague way parallels their own behavior. I mean, you know, you burn a dog or a cat and they'll yelp in pain. and All of that's easy to understand. They, we see them behave in ways that we can identify with. Worms, not so sure. But I have a friend, Lynn Margulis, who's like the founding mother of endosymbiosis, and she spent all of her time yeah. looking at... That's the sort of thing most people can't say. <laughs> <laughs> she, she spent most of her time looking at single-celled eukaryotes. Hmm. So these are not bacteria, but single-celled eukaryotes. And she just loved these. But the things. first life form on Earth, I think. No, those are the, the first life forms were bacteria. These are those are prokaryotes. I'm talking about eukaryotes, things uh -huh. that have nuclear membrane. Okay. And so she spent all of her life looking at these things, and she loved them. She was like, she, oh, look at this one, and look at this one, and mm. she knew all about them, and she had a relationship with them that, you know, she was thinking. She would even say something like. You know, people are like a virus on the planet and then the earth is heating up and the earth is going to shrug and then the viruses and the eukaryotes, single-cell eukaryotes, are going to take over and that's fine with her. Mm. So she was so dis distanced. Mother, I, I, I can agree with that sentiment, <laughs> by the way. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I get, the reason I'm asking about this is because um, we, when I talk to lawyers in general about human rights, they seem to not want to admit that the reason why humans are so very different from other species is because we killed off our, our, our closest ancestors. So, for example, Neanderthal and Denisovans and, uh, Homo, I guess, Homo erectus and maybe even mm. the uh, Flo Homo florensis and the, mm. the, these little creatures that used to live until 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 years ago, 
and you kill them all off, and then you say, oh, by the way, we're unique. Mm. We have unique human rights, and mm. these other creatures don't. Mm. Now there seems to be a movement in animal rights. So wait a minute, we're not the only ones on the planet. Uh, let's, how about the other apes? And then how about primates? And then mm. how about et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. But once you start down this line and say, it seems to me that there's a continuum of rights that we can ascribe to them. As you said, well, if you feel close to them, i.e. they're closely genetic to you, then you feel for them. Then the further away you feel less, the further away you feel less. Now, would you, is that, but that's not the way the law works, though, is it? Not at all. No, and in Australia, the law relating to human rights really doesn't work, well, at all, I would say. When it comes uh, to the rights we, of we the Because we don't have human rights protection in Australia. Huh. Okay. How about right. aliens? Let's talk about aliens then. Let's suppose that an alien spacecraft landed mm. in Melbourne, they came in and they said, hey, how are you? And I guess they, they said, hey, we're going to kill all you alien, you human beings. Now, uh, mm. what would you do with it? Would you try to make peace with these aliens? I mean, would you be a diplomat or would you say, oh, I hate other species? Or how do you deal with the rights of somebody who's going to kill you, for example? Especially if they're aliens. <laughs> yeah. Look, um, I, I guess I'd start a step earlier. Um, I think human rights, as understood in the West, is a reflection of enlightened self-interest. Self-interest is probably the most powerful and universal characteristic of human beings. You know, we infants are the ultimate in self-interest. They pursue self-interest relentlessly. And as children get older, they begin to recognise that their self-interest may be more effectively pursued by being deferred. And, and so they begin to think, well, if I treat that person the way I'd like to be treated, then things will go better for me. It's so, I, I think that's how it works. So enlightened self-interest. Now, human rights as recognised, I think is a reflection of enlightened self-interest. The most universally accepted philosophical idea uh, in virtually all religions and almost all philosophical schools is summed up in the Christian tradition as do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And I th the only philosophy I can think of offhand that doesn't embrace that is utilitarianism. Okay, but these others, you said the word others, and I'm asking, what, yeah. what do you mean by others? Well, that's, uh, that's a good question. I, you, there you have to take another step. Um, in recognising others and enlightened self-interest, there's an unstated major premise that I might be in that person's position at some time in the future, and therefore, by dealing with them well, um, so when it comes my turn, veil of ignorance. Exactly, it was it's similar. Similar. Um, that's right. Actually, it is. It's very similar rules as veil of ignorance, um, and you see this in particular in um, in the West in Mediterranean societies because they know how risky it is to be at sea. You know, one day you're uh, the voyager striding the earth, and the next day you're looking for help. Um, people have to recognise that they might be in the position of the other for the golden principle to make any sense. Now, most people, I suspect, could not imagine themselves being aliens with the powers that we suppose aliens have if they manage to get here. And so I'm not sure if they would apply that same principle. And we are beginning to see a departure from that principle in, um, in Europe with the arrival in Europe of a number of people fleeing what's happening in Syria. Because most people, I suspect, can't imagine themselves ever being caught up in the horrors of um, Fallujah or Aleppo. So, but you invoked self-interest. Mm. Now, self-interest is also something that you could imagine is not unique to human beings, but uh, other animals, for example, Absolutely. like lions. It's a survival instinct. Okay, so, so do you think that that type of uh, do unto others as you would have others do unto you, it applies to lions or snakes or chimpanzees. You mean, do they give effect to that idea? Well, I'm wondering. Well, I guess, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, self-interest is certainly something that is uh, you could imagine easily imagine is something that's universal in biology because mm. every, everything does what it to to survive. But as to you know, putting yourself in the position of the well, thing, something that you need to yeah. kill and eat. For example, you don't mean don't eat corn. 
You're not putting yourself in the position of that corn because, oh, you know, our mm. common ancestors were corn is 1.5 billion years ago. We don't care. That's too far for me to even imagine. Mm. Therefore, I am only going to put myself in the position of something that's much closer to me. It has a vertebrate, for example. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So you're willing to deal with, I'm going to kill everything over there, but if it's close to me, then I'm going to apply this principle. Or I'm going to apply the principle all over the place and just recognize that I have this sliding scale of identification with the other. Yeah. Um, okay, there's two levels to that. The first is, um, I think the capacity to identify with others is what we call empathy, and some people have more, some people have less, and that will guide their behaviour. But more to the point, I'm not sure that lions or frogs or worms have anything that could be identified as empathy. I just don't know. So in order for you to empathise with them, you were requiring them to have empathy? Um, I think empathy underpins the notion of do unto others as you'd have them do unto you because it involves you understanding what it must be like to be in that position. Now, if sentient creatures do not have a capacity for what we call empathy, then the existence of a golden principle is less likely. But I have not the faintest idea how lions think. You, you get the impression that dogs and cats may have empathy, but that's because we live with them. That's right. That's right. And we see the way and they I bet behave. If you live with lions, you would have very similar because they maybe so. Or, or alternatively, they might just have us for dinner. That's Who right. Who knows? That's right. <laughs> well, that's interesting. But the sentience, though, because there's a guy, a famous philosophical article about what's it like to be a bat. And the conclusion is, it's like nothing. It's too hard to imagine. So mm. therefore, you don't need to worry about it. Mm. It's, and it's a, re, it's a way to rationalize human uniqueness, where our brain is so big, only, us, only we understand these things. And so I guess part of the, this course that we're talking about is, how, are we alone? Well, how did we get here? It has a lot to do with trying to figure out who we are in the universe. And for example, I'm thinking of Harriet Tubman. She said something like, you know, how many slaves did you save? And she said, I saved about a thousand, but if they had known they were slaves, I could have saved a thousand more. And the idea was that if you don't know who you are, you're kind of helpless, but if you know who you are, you're in a, you're in a better position. So we cosmologists and astrobiologists are trying to figure out, okay, what are human beings? How do they fit into the universe? And if there's any truth to how we fit in, well, that eventually might help us some way. Mm. What do you think of that? Well, my first inner response is, we may just be a fleeting episode in the life of this planet, or and certainly a fleeting episode in the life of this universe. Um, I, I think the human species is an interesting experiment which will fail sooner rather than later. Oh, how soon? Well, let's think. Homo sapiens I'm talking about in particular. Homo sapiens have been around, what, for 200,000 years? Mm -hmm. um, the dinosaurs ruled the Earth for, what, four million years? A little bit longer, like 200 million. 200 million? Mm -hmm. Well, there you go. <laughs> Have we got another 199.8 million years in it? I don't I think don't, so. I don't think so either. Two, you're quite right, 200 million years, yeah. Um, I, I, I just don't think we will make it. And I, it's interesting to see that wherever human beings settle, um, they destroy most of the flora and fauna. And the, the clearest illustration of that is in New Zealand, where human habitation only started, what, 900 years ago. And the same pattern of destruction of flora and fauna is evident there in the wake of human settlement, as is evident in other places uh, at earlier times. Um, and, and Chernobyl, the area around Chernobyl, which has been closed off to human beings since the nuclear catastrophe there, the local flora and fauna are now re-emerging in a spectacular way, because human beings aren't there. So I, I, I think we're an interesting experiment, but one which will fail. Okay, let's role play. I'm an alien. I've come to the Earth planet, and I'm going to destroy everything on the planet. I'm going to kill you all. And you're going to try to defend humanity. So, hello, alien. Hello, human. We're going to kill you. I, I can understand that. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're going to do it, please do it. Uh, as painlessly as possible, because we, we feel a thing called pain, which is very uncomfortable, 
And I if we are I do care about your pain. I have zero empathy for you. You guys are too primitive. And yet you, you have no empathy for amoebas. I have no empathy for you. But you understand the concept of empathy. No, I, not in your situation. Among ourselves, yes, we have a golden rule among ourselves, but you do not qualify. You are too primitive. Your brains are too small. But if you understand the concept of empathy and you understand that we have a, an equivalent concept, well, then you would understand that we can suffer pain. Amoebas have a similar concept, but you have not taken the trouble to talk to them or care about them. You kill them daily, you, and therefore yeah. you do not understand empathy, therefore you are doomed and we're going to kill you. Our intelligence is not as evolved as yours. Um, right. We so did not understand that amoebas had empathy. That's why you are going to be eaten and gone. We don't care about you. Your culture is too primitive to be of any interest to us. Um, as intelligent creatures, it should be interesting to you to discover that despite our history of behavior, we do have empathy. And it's only for that reason that I ask you that if you destroy us, when you destroy us, you do it in a way that is going to be as little pain to us as possible. But you will still get the prize of having a planet which is emptied of human beings. But you <laughs> uh, you're just saying all this because you want to survive. It makes no sense to me. No, no, no. Not because I'm, I, I accept that you have the capacity to destroy us. I simply ask that you do it in a way that causes the least pain oh, really? for human beings who will be destroyed. So you're going to measure everything by how much pain we cause. What if, so you would rather we, we wipe you out in a, a picosecond mm -hmm. rather than a year. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's if the that's best happened, you can do for, if, if in you, defense of humanity? Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> I, I see our end as inevitable. If you are to hasten it, then make it as swift and painless as you can. A picosecond is fine. I think most of us wouldn't register pain in a picosecond. You sound rather detached from the demise of the entire human race. We've had a good roll of the dice, and I think we've screwed it up pretty badly. <laughs> Now, if you, were, if you were 20 or 30 years old, would you be so willing to just sacrifice the rest of your life to these, these alien marauders that were going to kill you? Um, I, I don't know what I would have thought if I was 20 or 30, uh, because when I was 20 or 30, I didn't turn my mind to these things. Hmm. But the idea of sudden death is painful only to those who are left behind. The person who dies suddenly and has no awareness of it doesn't actually suffer and they're not around to think later how tragic it was that they didn't grow up to be um, a cosmologist or a lawyer. Unless you're anticipating for many, many <clears throat> months this very quick execution. Yes, but I assume that you aliens <laughs> not going to tell you. are going to be sufficiently empathetic that you won't do that. No, we have no zero empathy for you guys. You are just too primitive. I'm sorry. We compare you to other life forms in the universe and you just do not qualify for our empathy. You're not worth it. Well, that suggests that your empathy is of a very low order. No, no. We empathize with everything whose brain is bigger than this. In other words, your empathy is of a very low order. <laughs> Oh, well, all right, so, all right, you're accusing your executioners of uh, having low moral thresholds. Yes. Uh, okay, well, thank you. <laughs> so, all right, next uh, thing. If that means I'm first on the block, <laughs> so be it. No. So what kind of aliens would you like to find? I mean, we might not be alone in the universe, and if that's mm -hmm. the case, there might be aliens. What kind would you, just as an emotional response, I mean, a lot of young men would say, hey, they want sexy aliens so they can go and have sex with. Well, I talk to my philosophical, my, my academic uh, astrophysicists, they want aliens that are kind of like godlike. They can tell us what the uh, solutions to our, so our problem, our equations are. So, but what are you, what kind of aliens would you like to find? I think I would like to find aliens who had sufficient breadth of mind and breadth of spirit to say, look, Here's where you screwed up. Here's how it could have been. Um, and maybe we can even show you the way to get to where you could go. So you want some moral progress, some answers to the moral problems of, of humanity because you're a lawyer and you're solving moral problems all day long? No, I'm not solving moral problems all day long. <laughs> you're dealing um, with them, certainly. D uh, dealing with some moral problems sometimes, yes. But... Um, 
if, if mankind's existence is to have any meaning at all, then being corrected out of our erroneous ways would be quite good. And if beings came along who could see, like a kindergarten teacher, could see, no, no, that's not how you do this, you do it a different way, then maybe we could be corrected. And maybe that would give us some prospect of independent survival. There's a burgeoning, not burgeoning, but there's a small field of astrobiology called uh, kind of like universal morality. If there's aliens, what type of morality will they have? Now, in accusing me of having a low threshold, you're essentially projecting your sense of morality on the entire sentient beings of the universe, as if your human morality has something to it that is more universal than just human society, for example. Now, is that hubristic? Um, it would be if it was true, but it misunderstands what I said. Okay. Um, you said uh, in your alien, with your alien hat on, that you had a concept of empathy, but it was only applied to creatures with brains larger than this. And I would say that is a distinct moral failing in any creature with capable of empathy. A distinct Once, moral failure? Yeah, So this absolutely. is like a universal evaluation <clears throat> of morality. Uh, That's if, what you're saying. Well, no, no, no. I'm saying that if, if a being accepts and understands the concept of empathy, then to say I'll only be empathetic for creatures who pass a test that I set for them, that seems to me to be a moral failing. I mean, empathy is itself a moral consideration. Um, the starting point of the analysis is that the alien has that moral feature and, and yet it suddenly shows a surprising limit. And that's a moral failing. Huh. So, you know, in physics, we think about electrons and protons, and then we think that there's hydrogen and water, you know, beyond the observable universe. But here you're taking a human moral feeling and then saying this should apply to any creatures. Now, when we talk about... No, hang on. No, I didn't say that. I said, so, oh, I, I, said I, 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 I said we I, should we should show empathy... Um, uh, the limits to our capacity for empathy seem to lie in our failure to understand the inner feelings of the creature we're dealing with. So if it's, a, uh, if it's an amoeba, we don't think it has empathy. But surely the um, degree in which you empathise has been selected for to be useful or not. And if empathy is useful, then you will think it's good. And if empathy <coughs> is not useful in your particular niche, then it's not good. And to pretend that empathy is universally good seems to me like very, I don't know, narrow. Sure, but I'm not projecting my views onto the universe. We had an alien who said <laughs> he was empathetic, uh, but his empathy had a limit and he wasn't interested in our right. so concept of empathy. Yes. And all I was saying was that shows a moral failing. Now, he and I were using empathy in the same sense. And if he claims to have it, then uh, it would be a moral failing to say, well, I'm not going to apply it to you, who are also empathetic creatures. I'm not going to apply it to you because your brain isn't big enough. So, so let's talk about other aspects of human morality that might qualify for applying to these aliens. Well, they're, they're going to tell me what their morality is, I assume. But don't you want to make some guesses? Like, for example, we could say, you know, Darwinism is something that we have confidence in as a way to understand life on Earth. So we said, well, you know, from Darwinism, probably, you know, variation <coughs> selection occurred elsewhere. So that's mm. an example of something that we can, with some confidence, project onto life forms elsewhere. Mm. But what about... On the assumption that the conditions for those life forms allow for the evolution of species so that natural selection gets a look in. Yes. It's not a, a self-evident... Okay. It's not so. Well, we do that, and I, I would, we could argue about that, but let's not. Let's talk about the moral aspect, hmm. and that is because some of my colleagues think that there is something you could call universal morality, and I have a hard time with human universal morality hmm. because there's so much variation in, in human cultures, but there must be some core of human <clears throat> morality that might be the best candidates for projecting or assuming that, hey, there's a society of aliens over there. What kind of morality would they have? Well, blah, 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 blah. So could you fill in the blah, 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 blah? I, well, you see, I wouldn't make the assumption. I, I, I don't actually think there is any universal code of morality. Um, self-interest is one uh, Self-interest, um, 
certainly I think is the starting point of the core of human morality such as we understand it. Not universal morality? Self-interest? I don't know. Well, if it's something that applies to all life forms on Earth, that you... I think okay, well, um, but, um, if, but if you're postulating um, a life form from some other planet, it may be from a planet where your survival is guaranteed. It's just, you know, part, it's written into the fabric of yeah, your society. So, they don't have so you, don't have, you don't have any concern about self-interest because your interests are looked after by oh. the way the thing is set up. I don't know, it's survival. possible. Well, that, I, that would invalidate the assumptions if your survival is guaranteed. Mm. But, uh, mm. okay, that that's would be a rare kind of life form. How about the nano aliens? Well, well, you say it's rare. How do you know? <laughs> I don't know. That's right. <laughs> it could that's be, right. It could that's, be recognised in an infinite that's number right. of planets. You're absolutely right. How about nano aliens? Um, look, maybe there are aliens in this office and we don't know about them. They're crawling everywhere and they're, they're doing all kinds of interesting hmm. things, but they're so small that we haven't seen them. This does sound so much like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> okay. um, uh, yes, and what's the question? The question is, uh, if I gave you $10 billion to look for, to tr under the condition that you are to try to answer the question, are we alone, would you invest in microscopy to find nano-aliens? Um, with a prize of $10 billion, I'd say a fair bit of effort was justified. And if that involves getting a microscope, sure, go for it. No, I'm asking you which, I mean, how to spend this thing. You're the, you're the boss of this $10 billion. And would you, for example, Yuri Milner gave $100 million to a breakthrough listen about a year ago, and they're upgrading the Parkes telescope and several telescopes around the world to listen in on potential radio signals between aliens. Would you do that, or what would you do? Um, what I'd do as a first step is consult a cosmologist like you to see where the probabilities pointed as the best likely place to look, and I'd work from there. Okay, you'd hire, you'd delegate authority, okay? <laughs> no, 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 no. I, w I, would, I would tap expertise okay. in order to make sensible choices. Right, all right, that makes sense. Um, you know Fermi's Paradox? Have you heard of Fermi's Paradox? Um, and let me remind no, you. I Fermi's Paradox is, you know, the galaxy is this big and it light, it's 100,000 light years across and it's 12 billion years old and we are about to produce spacecraft that can go maybe a tenth of the speed of light. If you tra travel that fast, you could call go from one end of the galaxy to the other in about a million years. There have been about 10,000 intervals of a million years since the beginning of the galaxy. Mm. And therefore, if life form, there's all planets everywhere, there's probably life everywhere. If that life forms, then it'll become intelligent and create technology. And then where are they? They're mm. not here. That's Fermi's paradox. Yeah. So do you have a solution um, to that? No. No, I don't. Um, but it reminds me of something that I've wrestled with for quite a long time, which is this. Let it be supposed that on, a, on another planet, even a planet within our solar system or possibly a planet around a nearby star, a life form is developed uh, which gets to that level of intelligence uh, that it is capable of sending radio messages in a form that we would understand if we detected them. And let it be supposed that at some point in our development we detect those signals and we respond to them. But by the time our reply gets back to them, they have disappeared because of the sort of things that intelligent life forms seem to do. Mm -hmm. um, have we communicated with them? And I mean, it's a very exciting possibility mm -hmm. that they send a message, we get the message, we reply to them, and yet it's meaningless, utterly but meaningless, because they don't know that we received the message and we don't know that they didn't get our reply. It's like migrants to Australia writing letters home and then the people at home have died in the meantime. Um, yeah, I guess that would be similar. And the question is, <laughs> um, is that communication? Have we communicated with them? Yeah. It would right. feel, right. Uh, from our end, it would feel as though we'd communicated. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say, no, we haven't. We certainly can't walk away from it saying, we know there exists a life form that has reached a certain mm -hmm. level of intelligence. Right. All we know, all we can say is that we know that there existed at some point a life form that was able to communicate with us or send us a message.
Yeah. Okay, let me ask it's the you. message in the bottle. That's, that's, it's the message in the bottle. And in fact, it reminded me of a cartoon I saw years and years ago when I was in the early days of computer work. Three, three bedraggled computer experts um, who've been washed up on a desert island. And one of them has gone down to the shore and has found a, a message in a bottle. And he's opened it and he's jumping for joy saying, we're saved, it's a contract. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, let me ask, so uh, let me ask you a question I asked before. Are we alone in the universe? I would have thought not. Because? Uh, because the universe is really big. And um, um, the, it seems vanishingly unlikely that all of the life forms that exist on Earth are the only life forms that exist anywhere. It seems unlikely that the Earth is the only place in the universe capable of supporting something recognisable as life. Um, and life has a remarkable way of emerging and taking hold. Um, now, that, I mean, I, I think, they, haven't they found algae or some such on Mars? No, uh, not really. There's no, been well, some hints, but okay. it's gone away. Okay. But even so, I mean, that's, that's just next door. So whether it's happened or not doesn't matter. But if you assume the existence of a couple of billion places in the universe where, at least in principle, life as we would recognise it is possible, uh, I would have thought the odds are that life would have emerged at some point in some of those places. Yeah, how about... Whether, whether it's right, the trouble is we tend to think, uh, does life exist elsewhere in the universe, i.e., do human beings like us exist right now somewhere else in the universe? That's a very different question. Mm -hmm. And uh, the answer to that, I think, is as much less likely. Mm. So uh, Superman and Lois Lane probably couldn't have had sex and had children because Superman came from another planet. I've never thought about that, but I'm grateful for the <laughs> insight into your complex <laughs> of being. Okay. All right. Uh, well, I was going to ask you another question. Um, you got Beethoven over there with a wig on. That's nice. um, <laughs> you made me forget what I was going to ask you next. Um, you don't know any uh, alien jokes, do you? Um, none that don't involve Peter Dutton. Okay. <laughs> Who's Peter Dutton? I don't know. Sorry, Peter, Peter Dutton is the immigration minister. Oh, I see. In okay. the Commonwealth of Australia. I see. Okay, so this question, are we alone? Is it an important question? I mean, these are students and they're interested in it. They seem interested. Why do you think they're interested? Or are you interested in this? Is it just a, some stupid intellectual exercise? Um, I'm interested in it, but I do find myself interested in stupid intellectual exercises. Okay. <laughs> Whether that means it's stupid intellectual exercise is another question. Only other people can answer that. Hmm. And uh, do you have any advice for the students? These are students who are not scientists necessarily, and there are some law students who will be taking this course. Do you have any advice to them about how to think about aliens or from a legal point of view? Because you have to deal with, I don't know, I guess laws. How do you deal with new stuff? So, so new situations are always coming up and say, well, how does the law deal with that? Well, aliens come up. How are you going to deal with that? Um, I think it would depend on the precise form of aliens to see what precise problem was created. I mean, if they're microscopic aliens, as you've suggested, it wouldn't matter. It wouldn't change anything. It wouldn't if they started to, I don't know, invade all the telephones and sell everybody and, and I don't make them okay. not work or something. Okay, or... let's suppose they invade the telephone system or the internet system, anything yes. run by Telstra. Yeah. They could invade that <laughs> and, and they could start sending intelligible messages to us saying, if you don't treat us better, we will knock out your internet connections for good. Or just knock out the internet connection because they don't like us. Yeah. They don't forget um, about how we you see, treat them. If that happened, then I think the institutional response would be, okay, what can we do for you guys? Because our self-interest would demand that. Uh -huh. Until they impinge sufficiently on our self-interest, we probably wouldn't do anything about it. But how about this, get back to this idea of self-image. I mean, part of the reason why I think I'm motivated to... Uh, think about this question is, I want to know how I fit into the universe or what it means to be alive, like, kind of like the meaning of life questions. And I'm not sure that finding out about other life forms will help, but I think it might. But am I fooling myself here? Do you, what do you think of the idea of, it's important to know where you fit into the universe? 
I'm thinking of the Truman Show. Have you seen the movie The Truman yeah, Show? The guy yeah, was yeah, in the yeah. hey, the whole world was made for him, and then he sailed into the wall, and he found mm. out hey, this is all simulation. Yeah. And somehow I think it's important to know if you're being put in a simulation or, uh, for example, I, I sometimes I'm surrounded by people who believe in free will, and I don't believe in free will. I think it's a pretending that you have a God inside of you and it's kind of like a form of, of theism and I'm kind of like an atheist. So I'm saying, why do all these people have think they have free will? It's a crazy idea. You break them open and there's just molecules in there. So I, uh, and so, I'm, but I keep on wondering because of course I feel like I have free will. Uh, free will is a necessary invention. A necessary invention? A necessary, a necessary delusion? Like I, a placebo? I'm not, that, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's necessary. Oh. But it's one of those things which I think was invented initially by the Christian churches so as to give us a sense that we must make ourselves behave in the way that the leaders say we should. It's a necessary fiction in the law because otherwise punishing a person for committing a crime makes no sense. I know it. that. I know that. That's why I brought it up. Yeah. But do you punish people? It makes no sense. If, I don't we know if do. you do. We do. I I, mean, but do you I, believe I in the free will? I, I don't practice in criminal law, but I see. Uh, undoubtedly the criminal law punishes people for what they do and the only justification for that punishment must be that the person had something like a rational choice. Now, an ironic extension of that, uh, which perhaps explains its origins, is that the more outrageous, the more horrendous the crime, the less likely it is that the person had anything that is recognisable as free will. And therefore, the person who commits truly, truly bizarre and horrible offences should probably not be punished, whereas the person who gets a, you know, parks in the wrong place or who speeds or drives while they're drunk, they probably should be punished because they had a choice. <laughs> But but punishment is one the retribution retributive justice but is one thing but how about hey they should be separated because the guy's crazy yeah that's the different issue though I guess that is a different issue I see but they're often they come together they do uh, and hence we have you know uh, prisons for the criminally insane I see. people who get acquitted I mean found guilty but uh, acquitted on the basis of diminished responsibility that makes perfect sense mm -hmm. and it's really it, at one way of looking at it, it's um, a recognition that the idea of free will is just invented. Well, do you believe that? Do I believe it's invented? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a necessary fiction. A necessary fiction? A, necessary, a fiction which is necessary if our existing uh, moral, religious and legal frameworks are to be justified. Are to be just, And if they're not to be justified, then you don't need it. Um... No, you don't. That's right. But then... Because I'm not a lawyer, so I don't need to justify I, I have, that, all that no, stuff. No, no. But, but, well, yeah, but hang on. Maybe you do, because you have to imagine yourself living in a society which does not have a legal system, which does not have a body of rules which are enforced by some um, but, but why do you authority. Think that, but, no, no, I don't think that you can have a body of rules that doesn't require the belief in free will. In other words, you don't have retributive punishment. You just set, you just make sure it doesn't happen again without blaming somebody. Okay, okay. Um, Can't you have that kind of system? Um, I suppose you could, and it would be quite an enlightened system. But there will be a boundary somewhere between offences which are could only be punished if you assume free will and offences which are to be punished because you can assume free will to the relevant extent. So, speeding. People people don't speed by mistake, by accident. They don't speed because some higher force takes over their mind. They speed because they know they're speeding, they want to speed, they think it's okay. Mm, I don't know, but a lot of professors are absent-minded. They're just going around and they don't know how fast they're going and then they're thinking about, uh, who, are we alone? <laughs> okay, uh, that's some people. That's a very small, okay. that's a very small okay. group. But let's get back to aliens. Do you think aliens will have laws? Um, we didn't used to have laws. I mean, we, when we were hunters and gatherers, presumably that we had some kind of like morals and don't don't steal and don't kill people. But uh, there are no laws, no well, lawyers. Well, those are laws. No, those are laws. Well, no, they're not. They're not written down. There's no books. Doesn't matter. Well, the, the, then dogs English, have laws. Then English law wasn't written well, down all for right, quite then, a long time. All right. So lions and dogs and worms have laws. Then they might. They might. But, well, they're not written down. Okay, no. But no, they behave in certain dogs ways. And, dogs and cats 
have rules that govern their behaviour. You can see they get crabby at each other. Say laws, say laws. You said laws. Yeah. Rules, laws. I mean, we tend to think of laws as just being the rules that we've institutionalised in our society. So maybe rules is a more useful expression. But I I don't think it's um, unrealistic to say that dogs and cats have laws in the same sense that we do. In other words, codes of conduct which, if breached, lead to adverse results. Well, well, do you think that's a universal feature of, uh, I don't know, uh, aliens that are sentient? Um, I'm very worried about an adjective like universal in a Uh conversation like this. Uh Um, I think it's possible to imagine a planet on which the beings have broadly accepted rules of conduct and which, if they're broken, um, cause those beings to evaporate, disappear, become suddenly disabled, prevent them from, in the future, departing from those Mm. rules or suffering some other consequence, which means the rule won't be broken again. That's Mm. possible. Mm. Yes. So that's... That would be a set of rules that doesn't have a legal system, doesn't need a legal system, uh, oh. like dogs and cats. I've got a friend who's studying, is writing a thesis or, on... Or <laughs> it might... I'm sorry to interrupt. Go on, go on. I mean, you could imagine a society in which the beings that populate it are sufficiently mechanistic that they can only do what they're programmed to do. Why not? I mean, like... Who's clock, doing the program? Who's doing the program? You don't need laws for clocks. Who's clocks don't have laws. They, they, they just act, behave the way they do because that's the way they're built. Couldn't you say the same thing about human beings and aliens? Possibly, but we, but we invent rules and we enforce those rules by imposing adverse consequences when the rules are broken. And we know that some people break the rules. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't need right. the legal system. Now... Clocks don't have a legal system that makes them keep the time. Right. So I'm trying to get back to aliens here. You are. You keep talking about clocks and dogs. And I want to because because aliens could have the characteristics of clocks, or they could have the characteristics of dogs or dolphins or people or worms. I don't know. Okay, so let's what about this dolphins. Dolphins and great apes. Do you think there should be dolphin uh, respect uh, dolphin rights? Gorillas, chimpanzee rights. Um, yes, uh, for gorillas and chimpanzees, yes, because and full human rights or just half of the human rights. Um, well, some human rights would not be relevant to them. Freedom of speech and expression, for example. Really? Uh, <laughs> you're not going to give them the right to do that. We don't try to stop them from doing it. Okay, because we haven't understood them yet, and when we do, that might be dangerous stuff they're talking about. It's possible. <laughs> there is a story about the, the chimps who were taught sign language to enable them to communicate, mm, right. and after about five years, one of them signed, we're very grateful for the lesson, but actually we're not <laughs> deaf. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Um, but, but, you know, I, I, I tested this in a different sort of human right some years ago. Imagine... Uh, a laboratory that breeds a strand of chimps that are just like any other chimps, except they're incapable of experiencing pain. They just cannot physically experience pain. Um, you, you could you could drive needles into them all over and they would not feel a thing. You can cut their hands off and they wouldn't feel a thing. And they're bred specifically for use... They're bred so that they can be used for uh, hyper-real fight scenes in in a oh, new strand of movies. Like I used to think that they used to use uh, criminals convicted of mm. the, in real movies and that wasn't the case. It was yeah. just fake. Um, Now, we know that as they attack each other, stab each other, shoot each other, get shot by human beings or massacred with machetes, we know that they do not suffer at all. But is it morally justifiable? And I would say no, because... It's, it's, I, 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 I can't actually quite articulate why I think it would be wrong, but I think it would be wrong. And the wrongness of it, as it appears to me, is a reflection of some 
concern about what you might think of as rights. Maybe the Maybe right you can't. not to be ex- uh, exposed to humiliating treatment. Maybe you can't envision really what it means not to experience pain. You're just so used to it that you think that uh, I just can't fully imagine somebody who can't. Possibly, but it's the... It's the uh, hypothesis on okay, which what do you the think? example proceeds. Now, there's another Australian, I think, from Melbourne, Peter, Peter Singer. Singer. Okay, Peter Singer. so tell me about what you've read of his and what do you think of his ideas. Look, um, I th- I've debated Peter a number of times on some of his ideas, and I think they're very interesting, but I have some difficulty with them. Um, his, his thinking has certainly brought animal rights from the lunatic fringe, where it was in the early 70s, into mainstream respectability now. And I think that's a marvellous thing that he's done. Um, Why is that marvellous? Why is that a good thing? uh, Because it's made all of us think a bit more carefully about what it's like to be a sentient being. So increasing your in-group? No. Is that the Um, same thing? Maybe. Maybe it is. Maybe it's increasing the in-group. That's another way of looking at it. So how big should it get? You don't want to get to. I know. I look. I would. I would. I think I'd probably take it out to the edge of my understanding of sentient beings. That's vertebrates. Six hundred um, million years. We've, we've just come full circle. <laughs> yes, we have. Yes, we have. Uh, well, this is a, this is an issue for me because I grew up thinking, you know what? I'm. I grew up in America. I'm just an American. I want to find out what it, it's like. And so I travel and say, whoa, I'm going to be a man of the world by experience different cultures. And then I start to identify with people of different cultures, different languages, different religions. I say, this is great. I feel like a real human being. And so I say, it must be even better if you could increase it, make it even bigger. So you can feel yourself embedded not just in human people, but in you know, larger groups like uh, primates. Yeah, and can identify with primates. And then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And so the more I learned about biology, the more that thing became, well, wait a minute, do I want to, how far do I want to go? I can't go to an electron here. Yeah. So, and there, so it must be a continuum, kind of a blurring out. But law, when I talk to lawyers, it's always like, yes or no, black and white, guilty or not guilty, do you have human rights, do you have a right or don't you? And I'm thinking, for example, that the value of a human being. In nature, if you plot the amount, the number of Time, the amount of deaths per time after conception, it's gigantic and it comes down steeply, stays mm. low and then goes up again. Mm. And so the value of a human being in the natural world is then pff, that it's like worth nothing and then you're worth a lot and then you go down. But in legal terms, it's like, we don't know about abortion somewhere here and then pff, you're full value, full value, full value, and then you're worth nothing after you die. So it's a, a box. Not right. It's not? not quite right. Okay. Um, so, um, straighten me out. Well, think about... Um, the uh, think about the idea that grave digging or grave robbing has always been regarded as a quite a serious crime. We do continue to pay some sort of respect to the dead human being. At least uh, within about 10, 20, 30 years. After a couple of hundred years, then it's archaeology. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that is right. Um, yeah. But that is a little bit of a blurring. It's the, yeah. It contradicts this black and white thing. And the thing ancient that. Greeks dealt with that. It's what, it's what? The ancient Greeks dealt with that problem. Oh, how did they do that? Um, I'm just trying to remember the name of the play. Um, um, the, the, uh, the, the... God, the woman the play is named for, her brother is killed by the tyrannical ruler... And the tyrannical ruler decrees that the corpse will be left on the hillside mm. to be devoured by dogs and mm. crows. Yes. And um, she protests and she tries to get her sister in to help bury the body in a way that is respectful. Yes. And she suffers the consequences of doing that. Mm. Um, wow. And it's, um, I keep on thinking Medea, but it's not Medea. Okay. She threw herself off the wall or something. I'm not sure. Yeah. But okay, now there there is such a thing as a post detection committee. Paul Davies, one of my colleagues, is like the president of the post detection committee. It's a committee that's formed. Like, once we find aliens, what are we going to do? 
and uh, we're gonna do, we have to figure it out. So I sometimes kid him and I say, what are the terms of your unconditional surrender to these aliens going to be? Um, is there any role for lawyers in, when we detect aliens? Uh, I don't know, uh, communicating, negotiating some kind of agreement, how we're going to be treated as slaves or ex being executed or I'm wondering how you're gonna negotiate no. our surrender no, um, because I think, um, given what you postulate, we're going to find ourselves back in the realm of the Melian Dialogue. The Melian uh, Dialogue, the, when the Greeks the were going to the, take the, 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 uh, the history of the Peloponnesian Wars. That's like, that's like wars. the first massacre or something, isn't it? The first well, genocide or well, something? Well, it certainly wasn't the first one. Uh, well, <laughs> all right, the first recorded one, it's I think. Perhaps the first recorded one, mm -hmm. um, because during the Peloponnesian Wars, Athens, which wasn't doing too well, needed a, a convenient launching point to attack Sparta. The island of Melos is not very far from the Peloponnese, and so um, they went to the island of Melos and they said, well, look, chaps, we're going to take you over. Yes. There's an easy way and there's a hard way. Yes. And they said, we know you've never done any wrong by us, and you'll think it's unfair. But as you know, justice is only relevant between equals in power. And where power is unequal, the strong do what they will, and the weak suffer what they must. Now, that's that's the history, the theory of justice, as expounded in uh, the um, history of the Peloponnesian Wars. Do you think that? And applies? it's easily recognisable. That's the way international relations work these days. Will that and be I the way Star Wars will work? That's the way it'll work. That's the way. It so you have confidence in that aspect of relations on Earth being projected out onto other beings. No, but you've already you've already um, threatened adopted you. the role <laughs> yes. of the alien who comes here and says, "Well, you know, right. we understand you're empathetic, but until your right. brain's that big, right, right, you're right. toast." I see. And if if aliens come here and they want to take us over rather than cooperate, uh -huh. um, uh, they will have the capacity to do that by definition they've got the technological ability to get here but you're giving what they want but you're giving me much harder time than I imagine you would give Douglas Adams when they're building this intergalactic thorough interstellar thoroughfare and the earth has to go remember that one yeah but all I'm saying is I'm responding to your question about whether <laughs> lawyers would be needed to negotiate right I don't think negotiation would be relevant okay. um, because um, they will only be concerned with what they can do, mm. not what they ought to do. Mm. And if we're in there negotiating, we'll just be trying to persuade them that they shouldn't do what they can mm. and what they want to do. Right, that's pointless. I, I wouldn't send lawyers in. I'd send philosophers in. I see. Okay. And uh, have you ever been abducted by an alien? Not that I'm aware. Okay. So you, not that you're aware. Okay. No. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, last question. Um, can you give us some advice for these students on how to think about this question, are we alone? Give some advice to these young students. They're listening to you. They want to know, I, I've never even heard of this. Does this make any sense? Is this an important question? Can you help them out with, should they be rational? Should they be irrational? Should they combine things together? Should they read more Greek uh, history? Should they study the origins of biochemistry on Earth? What, or all of the above? Um, well... Are we alone? It depends on what the question means. It depends on what alone means. Uh, if alone means, are there other beings that we would recognise um, in, in a place where they can get to Earth and hold us to account, then I suspect we're alone. Um, are we the only creatures that ever existed in the universe? Almost certainly not. Um, now... I, maybe we need to ask ourselves a different question. Assuming, assuming we how will we feel when some other sentient beings come to this planet and see how we screwed it up? Are we, are we, do we want to leave a legacy of complete stupidity or would we like them to have a look at us or what's left, and say, ah, that was uh, quite a good society, we should model ourselves on that. Um, so he's putting uh, the aliens in the role of grandchildren. Uh, that's probably not inaccurate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, 
I, I guess it all depends on what you assume about the nature of the aliens who get here. Um, but if they're beings that can learn anything at all from us, I would hope they'd learn something useful um, and something positive. Not, here's a good example of what you don't do, but rather, here's a good example of a model to be emulated. I would much prefer that. Because for what it matters, if, if our species is to leave any traces anywhere in the universe, it would be nice that we left a trace that people thought admirable. Um, and, and the only justification I have for saying that is that I think most individual human beings would like to think that they're well thought of after their death. So why shouldn't a society wish to feel well thought of? Well thought of by death? their in-group. Um, once you've postulated aliens who can get here and do what they will, you're going to um, put them in your in group. They're in the in group. Yeah. <laughs> See, if they, if <laughs> they, they're as good with they that don't, club. They don't only belong to the club, they just bought the club. If they can fly and build and fly an airplane, they're in uh, my in group. Um, yeah. Pretend yeah. That. Yes, the, the <laughs> Greek uh, heroine who wanted to bury her brother decently was Antigone. And her courage is recorded by Sophocles in his play of the same name. And she probably fits in to somebody who has done something admirable that she's remembered for, as you would like humans to do on the planet Earth. Uh, indeed. I would hope that Antigone's example is something that aliens will notice <laughs> when, they, when they stumble onto this ruined planet and pick up a thing which we would call a USB stick and find in it some very strange things called words about an old lady called Antigone. Oh. Sorry, a young woman called Antigone, Antigone. who is now, okay. by definition, extremely ancient. I, I still find strange your need or ability in your noblesse here to hope that our noble behavior will be remembered by aliens who, I suspect, will not share any iota of what we think is noble. Um, I'm having a hard it, time with that. It, you know, I understand the question, and I think it is a slightly displaced form of self-interest, uh, because if every human being on the planet had the same sentiment and wanted to leave a society, assuming that at some point we perish, um, and want to leave a society which others would regard as noble, then all of us will behave better. Yeah. And I think behaving better and in a more enlightened way, is something that the human race really needs. Well, that's if what it comes from either really saving needs. the planet, which is, well, saving the planet is kind of a good idea. Um, I, I think global warming is probably the first order issue facing our generation. Um, and next layer down, human beings treating each other decently. Well, but there's also important. the opposite point of view is who cares how you're remembered, uh, you know... Uh, they all die, and therefore it doesn't matter. Yeah, I know. And yet, many people live their lives uh, with the unstated assumption that they would like to be remembered well or yeah. be thought of well. Yeah, they do. They do. Um, but whether why it matters is a really interesting question, well, and yet but, it seems to. But I've spent a large fraction of my life trying to get away from what I consider to be monocultural, myopic, moral values, and this might qualify. That is, hey, I want to be remembered. Mm. You know, that's the same reason why the guy built, Cheops built the giant yeah. pyramid, right? Yeah, well, oh, that's, Ozymandias, uh, Ozymandias, <laughs> yes, the right. greatest Ozymandias. example. Yes, yes. Well, for, but I've been trying to avoid being Cheops and Ozymandias. I said, hey, uh, my legacy is not so important, because he says, my legacy is so important, I'm going to enslave 10,000 people and have them sweat and die for mm. my legacy. Mm. And uh, I, you wouldn't go that far, I bet. No, no. <laughs> but, but um, I mean, Ozymandias is a powerful poem precisely because it shows how our selfish aspirations for immortality can go off the track. Selfish, but you're just and talking about your Shelley aspirations for legacies. That's not, that you didn't put the word selfish in there before. No, no. Now it's become selfish. It, well... It can look selfish. But then, you see, there was a degree of hubris with Ozymandias that... That doesn't perhaps, exist in your noble version of I want to be remembered? Well... No. 
I think wanting to be remembered well is is not in the same league as Ozymandias. <laughs> Remember the, the, the <laughs> caption said, Behold my works, ye mighty, and despair. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, that's not nobility. Okay. 